The mother load there in the just pre-internet period, uh, AOL and its precursors, it, you know, it, it actually created a, a thing for Commodore first and then for TRS-80. And then they had a deal to build Apple's network, the private network branded by and run by Apple for Apple users, for Mac users. And Apple uh, canceled the project, uh, but as a uh, escape valve to get out of the contract, they let AOL keep all the technology. And so a AOL launched the AOL service on a uh, technology base that was gonna be Apple's private network for its Mac owners. And the rest, as they say, is history. Uh, AOL became the big behemoth just before the internet, and then they misplayed the transition to the internet, and, and then we know what happened after that. This time, Jim Rutt, host of the Jim Rutt Show podcast, joins John and Scoop for a wide-ranging discussion about business and technology. Jim details his start in business and tech, his time running network solutions, the evolution of the internet, cancel culture, and AI censorship. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of the Plutopia Podcast. Our guest today is Jim Rutt. Jim is the host of the Jim Rutt Show, which is uh, another podcast that you should be listening to. He's the president and co-founder of MIT Free Speech Alliance. He's uh, the executive producer of the film An Initiation to Game B, and we'll definitely be talking about Game B today. He's also creator of Network Wars, which is a popular mobile game. He was chairman at one time of Santa Fe Institute, uh, which it was a very complex job, I'm sure. He was CEO of Network Solutions, which operated the .com, .net, and .org domain namespaces on the internet until it was acquired by VeriSign back in 2000. So Network Solutions used to be the place to go to get your domain name. And Jim was the first CTO of Thomson Reuters. He was chairman of the computer chip design software company, Analog Design Automation, uh, until it was acquired in, by Synposis in 2004. And I don't know, there's a lot more stuff on your resume. Too Jim, much shit, I, too much shit. I'm retired. I'm just a fucking around old dude, basically. Yeah, me right? too, me too. <laughs> so here we are. Our backgrounds are in our past. Exactly. Our past is in the background. Exactly. I, say, I used to do business. Now I don't, right? <laughs> so how did you get started on all that stuff? I mean, did you just kind of, were you like a, a Horatio Alger guy who worked your way up into it or what? Yeah, pretty much. You know, I was a, a college textbook peddler in Eastern Kentucky uh, when I uh, started seeing on professor's desks in the, uh, late 70s, these weird boxes with names like Imsi and North Star and uh, uh, Myths and things like that. What the hell are these things, right? And they said, they're computers. And I go, what? Because uh, when I've been in college, I dabbled just a teeny bit in computers, taking one course and did a, a fair bit of uh, part-time work for the uh, physics department, geophysics department, modeling atmospheres and shit, writing Fortran programs. But I didn't like it. You know, didn't like the... Uh, the kind of nerd culture, didn't like the mainframes, the glass rooms, the rules and regulations, didn't like any of that crap. Uh, but when I saw computers on professor's desks, I said, hmm, this is interesting. So I started researching it and subscribed to Byte Magazine. Remember Byte Magazine? Oh, yeah. Started going to computer stores and just hanging out and uh, started saving my nickels. And then in 1980, I bought a uh, top of the line Apple II 48K. Holy shit, right? Man, two I remember floppies. Those. I was the only, not the only, but one of the few dudes in Lexington, Kentucky with two floppy drives. So people would love to come over to my apartment and copy software, right? Back in the day when you could still do that easily enough. There was a crazy way to uh, copy it with just one drive, but it had to write something. Oh, you flop a disk. I was a pain. Anyway, so, uh, so that's how I got into this stuff. I think they uh, called them floppy disks because you had to flop them back and forth all the time. Exactly. And they were, of course, floppy. Right? They were very floppy, yeah. I remember, I remember uh, well, my buddy who ran the computer division at Heathkit uh, at a trade show. He had a very cool button. They were about to replace their floppies with early Winchester drives. And his button said, floppy now, hard later. <laughs> a few months ago, I ran across my first hard drive, which was a Radio Shack 10 megabyte hard drive. And he's like, 
when I got it, it was like, oh, this is so great. So now I can't find anything. It's just 10 megabytes. <laughs> You can't even find a, a you know a flash stick, right? That's less than a gig, probably. But anyway, yeah, I so remember I, when twenty megabytes was an upgrade. Yeah, exactly. I just, I'm going to geese here. You know, I remember my first, uh, my second company. Actually, we, you know, figuring out how to buy a four hundred meg hard drive for our Vax, which was about a hundred thousand dollars, right? Which is about the price of a house in those days. We managed to finagle it, but yeah, 400 meg was 100 grand for a back 1984, 85. But anyway, so I uh, sort of got into personal computing and you know, wrote the world's championship uh, Othello program just for shits and giggles. That was kind of fun. I actually beat an IBM mainframe head up. That was good. Wow, cool. Uh, and then I uh, discovered uh, just along the way, I discovered something called The Source, which was the world's first consumer online service. Actually, I just, I know exactly how I discovered it. They had a magazine they published called Source World and picked it up at a computer store in Cincinnati. And I read this thing and I immediately became, what is this? The idea of people connecting on a network. This is the craziest thing I've ever heard of, right? And, uh, and I was just about to transition out of textbooks publishing into uh, software. I'd gotten a couple of jobs, offers as, you know, my marketing VPs for educational software companies and what have you. But at the last minute, I said, you know, I'm going to write a crazed letter to this source company and tell them how I can make them billions of dollars. And I laugh at the hubris of it. I literally said, I have an idea for a $4 billion business for you guys, right? Which was essentially online education. This is 1980, right? Wow. Um, and amazingly, uh, they responded to my letter. You know, and I realized, and I, after the fact, I realized their current revenue was like two or three million a year. But oh yeah, it's a four billion project. Good. They went. They just said, next time you're in D.C., stop in here. And uh, they were located out in Northern Virginia. It turned out my parents were living in Northern Virginia at the time. I was heading up there for Thanksgiving, so I dropped in. We kind of hit it off, and they offered me a job, and I said yes. Uh, and so essentially, what I had done was. Uh, skipped over the software. It was the natural thing for a dude like me in 1980 would have been to go to work for a software company or start a software company. Uh, in fact, I thought about making my Othello program and offering it and putting it like you did in those days in Ziploc bags with little labels stapled on them. But the Hayden's, Hayden software that basically, I think it was a brother and a sister, came out with a Othello game a million times better than mine, blew it away. Like, oh, shit, missed my window right before I was ready to do it. But anyway, so I decided, but networking was cooler anyway. It just appealed to me in some deep, visceral, limbic sense. And so I went to work as a sales dude, regional sales manager for the Midwest, uh, moved to Chicago, you know, did that for a bit. And a few months later, that was I got for Source? The Source, the original. The Source? The, was the source was the first consumer online service by I, I went to work for them in uh, December 1980 yeah no, late November 1980 and uh, you know by 81 uh, we had most of what's on the web today oddly in some broad sense you know we had mail news uh, news wires chat uh, forums so-called uh, so precursors to uh, bulletin boards and things. We even had something called, by 82, we had something called Participate, which was a weird, strange conferencing system, uh, sort of vaguely a predecessor of social media, but not exactly. Uh, you know, we had uh, shopping, you know, we, uh, you know, kind of, you know, amazingly, and of course, this was in text mode only. Uh, yeah. you know, the basic sort service was uh, 30, 300 baud, 30 characters a second. If you were a big swinging dick, you could have 1,200 baud, yeah, 100 characters in a second wow and uh which was a little faster than most people could read 30 was a little slower than most people could read so that was kind of the limiting factor in those days but yeah all that, it was amazing it was, it was the beginning literally we were there and it was fun but after Same about two years floor. i left after about 20 months the company got acquired by the reader's digest like the week after i went to work for it that and sounds odd when that, the reader's that digest odd. yeah they, they now they're defunct but at the time they were one of the most po uh, uh, profitable publishing companies uh, in the world. And they decided to throw like a couple of million dollars into acquiring this silly little thing because it was about to go tits up. I didn't know it at the time I took the job. Oh, well, you know, that's what you get when you're a 26 year old and don't know diddly about this kind of stuff. Uh, and uh, so 
but you know they came in but the, they just were incompetent you know they brought in a bunch of corporate executives you're talking about readers digest right yeah reader digest and the source the source was also i mean i'm incompetent. kind of surprised that readers digest would have the foresight to acquire a company like that mm -hmm. in at that time they yeah. had one good guy there they had one really good guy named graham keeping and he was when he was in charge of the source the source was actually moving forward but he was a very iconoclastic dude. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know if you remember this. this is, we're, we're talking, you know, geese in here. The Reader's Digest had this big series of how to do it books, you know, uh, with, like how to fix your house and how to do carpentry and all of that. Anyway, he invented that whole series, Reader's Digest, and the original one on carpentry and home repairs. Uh, he'll actually show you that his hands are mostly the hands that are uh, using the saws and doing the drills. And that was gigantic, huge money maker. So we had a lot of credibility in the digest. And he's the one that suggested it. So that's how it Yeah, Reader's Digest has never been uh, or never was uh, the place you would associate with uh, an icon any iconoclast. That was not their thing. They were more of the uh, uh, very, very middle American conservative uh, version of reading. Yep. That, was, that was them. Our, our house was full of Reader's Digest condensed books. And, you know, we got the Reader's Digest every month. And so I was well aware of uh, who and what they were. Now, it's interesting. The other very early online service, um, uh, CompuServe, uh, was eventually, who the hell, did, who acquired them? Some, somebody. Anyway, I don't know. Uh, the source did get acquired by the digest, never amounted to what it could have been uh, due to clueless management. I was there 20 months. We had five CEOs. The last one was totally intolerable. And so I said, look it, and went off and started, uh, did a startup with another guy where we took the technical ideas, you know, because one of the things the source did do was figure out how to get the cost of uh, time sharing way down. Of course, we had to, right? Because uh, we were going for consumer market. And so we were easily a tenth the cost of, mainframe based time sharing. And did you have any idea at the time that this thing called the internet was existed or was in development? Nope, I never even heard of it until about 1987 or 88. Uh, you know, and in fact, for a long time, the internet was not the model, as you probably recall, it was walled gardens, right? Oh, yeah, BBS is. Uh, yeah, or even, you know, even the BBS was kind of that weird intermediate period in the late 80s, early 90s, but all through the 80s, uh, the model that we all thought was going to happen were these independent walled gardens, the source, the copy serve, and then prodigy prodigy. Uh, I got a yeah. job, off, a big job offer, big that executive vice president at prodigy, but turned it down. Yeah. Uh, General and, electric had the genie and uh, genie. that was around shortly for a very short time. <laughs> it, uh, it was around for quite a while. Actually a friend of mine oh, really? was the CEO, Mark Walsh. Uh, oh. and, and yeah, that's where for, all the science fiction writers showed up. Sifwa got, pretty heavily invested in genie yeah. so science fiction writers went there so therefore science fiction fans went there yeah, i wish i'd have known that i i i bailed when i learned about the internet and <laughs> i never went back yeah, that's what happened to a lot of us you know we were you know i was a member of all the damn things the uh, and then of course the the, the mother load there in the just pre-internet period uh, AOL and its precursors. It, you know, it, it actually created a, a thing for Commodore first, and then for TRS-80, and then they had a deal to build Apple's network, the private network branded by and run by Apple for Apple users, for Mac users. And Apple uh, canceled the project, uh, but as a uh, escape valve to get out of the contract, they let AOL keep all the technology. And so AOL launched the AOL service on a uh, technology base that was going to be Apple's private network for its back owners. And the rest, as they say, is history. And uh, AOL became the big behemoth just before the internet. And then they misplayed the transition to the internet. And, and then we know what happened after that. Mm -hmm. they went. Yeah, AOL provided the uh, world with unlimited drink coasters to... Uh... <laughs> Yeah, they make great Christmas tree ornaments too. I, I actually did that when I was living in the <laughs> Bay Area. I, I I kept them in. I had all the friends and family give them to me, and my wife went and took a drill, drilled them, and we hung them from a little pine tree, and it was amazing looking. Yep, I actually met the woman who came up with that idea: bury the world in CDs, <laughs> right? And, and she said it worked, and it did. Obviously, you know, AOL just dominated uh, that epoch. 
uh, and then very wisely, though Steve Case is still very embarrassed. I know Steve a bit, and, you know, he's very embarrassed by the deal. I would say Steve shouldn't have been embarrassed. You did good work for your for your shareholders, where they merged with uh, uh, with who was it? Time Warner. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and you know, I oh, they uh, my, my friend of mine, but so you traded internet currency for U.S. currency, right? And uh, worked out great for the AOL shareholders, not so well for the, uh, uh, the you know the Time Warner shareholders. Uh, and then, you know, because again, that was right before the internet became dominant and, and essentially just crushed all the walled gardens. Yeah. And of course, the internet almost didn't become dominant. The dot com bust happened at some point. Was it, were you at Network Solutions by that point? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. In fact, that would uh, have been around 2000, right? Yeah. In fact, uh, the dot, dot com bubble was why I ended up selling not, uh, Network Solutions, right? Uh, we had, uh, I came in there and took it over in June 99 as a takeover, uh, not a takeover, a uh, turnaround. It's kind of a fucked up mess, frankly. Uh, you know, famously incompetent customer service, really weak technology. Uh, you know, we had a good finance department, pretty good legal department, but our opera line department just sucked. And uh, yet here they are, a publicly traded company with a monopoly on domain names. Jesus, right? And some of my friends said, why the hell would you, you know, leave a great job, CTO of Thompson, which was a great job. I loved it uh, to do this goddamn thing. I said, well, you know, it's easier to fix something than it is to build something. And uh, a monopoly toll booth on the internet in 1999 sounds good to me, right? And uh, of course, I had an unfair advantage about the internet. I had uh, joined in 1989 this uh, oddball little online community called The Well. Yes. Uh, John and I both uh, are longtime Wellians. I was actually uh, toasted to the well by a guy named Mitch Kapor, who uh, yeah, I know Mitch. Yeah, his company was one that invented one, two, three. His buddy Jonathan Sachs actually wrote it, and uh, Mitch was a very smart marketer and product dude. And between them, they co-founder of Electronic Frontier Foundation. Yeah, and in fact, the EFF was cooked up on the well. Right? Exactly. I was, yeah. I was member number seven, right? Uh, so yeah. So, but anyway, there was, I, it was a huge unfair advantage for me in my business career, having been on the well, because the well was where people were really thinking about the internet. What does this mean? By 1990, you could get to the well via the internet. And weirdly, I had an account on a Bay Area ISP, and I'd dial in from Virginia, long distance, to uh, get a connection on the internet and connect to the well and various other sources. So this was at the very dawn of all that crap. So uh, I could see it happening and was able to apply a lot of what I learned uh, into various businesses. Because as I, you know, the famous joke, you know, if there's two hikers running along the, uh, walking along the trail, you know, it says, what happens if there's a bear, if a grizzly shows up, it says, well, I'm going to run. And the other guy says, you can't run faster than a bear. And the guy says, well, I don't have to run faster than a bear. I just got to run faster than you. Uh, and so that was uh, uh, how I put my uh, knowledge of the internet from the well, mostly to work was uh, just being making sure my companies were faster than people who didn't have that information. Yeah, I recall it was a pretty big deal when the well connected to the internet. Uh, a lot of people who were there kind of wondered why they were doing it and didn't completely understand. But especially for people like me who were logging in from like remotely from Texas, I mean, at the time you had to pay real money for long distance service. And if you were going to call into the well, you know, that was going to be expensive and you'd look for alternatives like uh, PC Pursuit or uh, what is it, CPN, CompuServe Packet Networks. There were various ways to get a little bit cheaper access, but it was still expensive. And then uh, with the internet, if you just had internet access, you could telnet to the well and it was, you know, uh, it was easy and it was inexpensive and you could be there as much as you wanted to. Absolutely. Well, though they still charge by the hour for quite a while, even after internet access, because computers were still expensive in those days. But the cost was way less than uh, the dial-in. Yeah, I, when I mostly dialed in X25, you know, tel uh, uh, Telenet or TimeNet or whatever them damn things were into the well. They had access by '89 to those things. wasn't just dial-in anymore. But yeah, but the internet once uh, you know internet once you got a, a regular internet connection locally, and I eventually did get one through PSI net fairly early at the office, but not at home, and uh, would be able to get into the well. And, and then at some point it became a fixed monthly price for the well as well. And that, you know, that just sort of changed how we thought about these things. 
Well, it's kind of, there was an interesting thing happening there. That, that was where you had a convergence of the BBS world with the internet world, you know, and bringing those two things together uh, had a certain power to it, uh, which I hadn't really thought about. I've been reading The Modem World by Kevin Driscoll, this book that was just released, and Kevin's on the well. And uh, he talks a lot about the BBS world as being sort of the, the real generative source of the internet as we know it today yes, more so than just like you know the invention of tcp ip or whatever it was certainly a big piece but i had a, a bolt and board business actually in that era uh, called uh, uh what was it called v uh vb connect it was uh, i remember vb connect yeah that was for uh visual basic programmers and i had a deal with microsoft i had my brochure and every vir uh, visual basic box and i combed all the bullet other bulletin boards finding software snippets and reviews and things and it was the damn thing was remarkably successful uh, uh but i ended up getting sucked in back into corporate america in late 92 and i ended up just selling uh, vb connect for a nice price but uh uh, but it's it probably good that I did, but I don't know. I don't know what would happen because it was right at that, that uh, cost, but could have gone on and become an internet service, but uh, it was a quite successful uh, little uh, uh, BBS uh, product, 16 line uh, TBBS system that I hacked together myself. And uh, yeah, that, that, yeah, that was kind of interesting, that little, that little epoch between the walled gardens and the internet. Yeah, the finding out about the BBS uh, culture that pro cropped up especially in the bay area where i was living there uh it, it you know i've been playing with computers and messing around with them but i found out about bbs's and got addicted and of course i ran up huge phone bills but when the internet became less of a expense and you know you it, it, with the incredible speeds that really <laughs> i believe started to let people get interested in the internet and get onto it. But BBSs were kind of a, you know, you had to kind of be a geeky person to <laughs> get involved with that. But the internet became very much a consumer uh, service. Over time, and that's kind of interesting. You think about the, the arc of history, you know, the earlier stuff, Compu the source and CompuServe uh, were tended to be special interest focused, uh, particularly CompuServe. In fact, uh, one of the, re the reasons I quit the source was I was uh, essentially product manager for half of the source. And I did a 16 page paper, which said the future of the source is communications and connecting people, especially around their interests. And I had focused on researching our closest competitor, CompuServe, and they were really taking off with their special interest groups. They had hundreds of them, you know, are you a collector of Packards, right? Are you a civil war reenactor? Are you a a uh, person who is an inventor, or you a person who has some breed of dog, uh, there could easily be a special interest group on CompuServe. And this I saw as the future of networking here in 1982. And of course, it's, it's what happened for a long period of time. And it's actually what's happening again as we're moving back in many ways towards uh, vertical interests rather than the horizontal. Uh, but that was, and that's where the BBS came in. Most of them were fairly specialized, virtual basic uh, programmers, uh, you know, uh, game players, uh, you know. Th th so the, the vertical has always been, I thought, one of the superpowers of the nets, whether it was internet or the pre-nets, in that uh, these relatively specialized interests, there's only a relatively small number of people in the world. And if you're living in, you know, West Buttfuck, Kentucky, like I was, the chances of finding such people was Zippo. Uh, but if you have yeah. access to the world, uh, there are lots of such people that share your own uh, peculiar interests. And uh, I saw that as the initial superpower of the networks. And I still think it is one of one of these superpowers. Of yeah, the I was in the same thing. When we started Fringeware back then, um, our insight was that there were people who were on the fringes kind of everywhere. Uh, and in any little town, they might only know one or two other people, if that many, who thought about the things they thought about, but bring them together online and suddenly you're building a community. And I think that that was part of the initial power of the Internet, that it was fueled a lot by um, like service to people who were finding parts of the world that that they could never touch before. I think that was a big part and parts of, of culture too. 
Yep. And you know, it's been an extreme, people talk about the bad of the internet and then I'm sure there, then there definitely has been some bad things that come from, but also been just a tremendous amount of good things. People to find each other. Uh, you know, I think that some of the acceleration of uh, human rights over the last 30, 40 years have been significantly accelerated by the internet. I think, you know, I don't, you know, to my mind, it's still amazing how quickly uh, gay liberation happened, culminating in gay, gay marriage in 19 and 2010. Uh, I don't think that would happen without the internet. Uh, you know, it allowed people to find each other, organize around interests, organize politically, uh, and get, then get the ideas out relatively inexpensively to other people. The ideas resonate, they spread. Next thing you know, you have a uh, quite unprecedented historical victory for human rights. Uh, I think very substantially accelerated by the internet. Yeah, the flip side of that coin is it also accelerated the ability to uh, distribute misinformation, disinformation, bad things. It's true. Uh, it is true. But you know, it, it essentially accelerated all information. In fact, to uh, Stuart Brand's famous saying, you know, in, you know, information wants to be free. And of course, on the internet, it comes damn close to being free, right? Uh, well, he also be, said information, information wants, wants to, be, to expensive. be expensive. Yeah, yeah, he did. He said both. And that for a long while was a conflict and still is to a degree, but free has won, I think, in most cases. I mean, uh, you know, I have so many ways to get around uh, subscriptions to uh, scholarly journals, for instance, right? Uh, you know, they want to charge you $39 for an article, but there are lots of ways to get them for free if you're, if you're tricky, right? Uh, so it, it wants to be free. It wants to escape from these uh, from these scholars. But yeah, the disinformation, you know, the, and of course you can't get one without the other. Really, it's hard to get freedom. Uh, freedom, you know, means free, and it means freedom for the good and the freedom for the bad uh, to to spread. And you know, you have to decide. Make the the cultural bet: is the benefit of the good greater than the cost of the bad? And I think that's one of the things that's often missing in the discourse around internet uh, moderation. I won't use the censorship word because that kind of in some ways is a misleading word, but uh, you know, the, the idea of uh, suppression of uh, content on networks. Um, and I, I'm pretty, pretty strong on the view that while it seems you win more than you lose by getting rid of the bad stuff, I'm not sure that's at all true. Uh, and I, you know, we call it the garage band effect or the green sprouts at the edge of the woods effect. You know, most garage bands suck, but if it wasn't for garage bands, rock and roll would never move forward. And the reality is you can't tell what garage band's going to move forward or not on the first day of the garage band. And I'd say the same is true for heterodox political, social, and economic ideas. They may seem crazy as, as all get out uh, when they're first proposed, but it may turn out to be what we need to save civilization. So I'm willing to take some Q nuts running around loose uh, in return for allowing Game B to exist, for instance. Well, I'm, we, we should get to Game B, but I, uh, it seems to me that there is a distinction that we kind of have to make between bad stuff and actually dangerous stuff. And I do think that there's like some overstepping there and people get, you know, there are some people who are hypersensitive and who want things shut down just because it offends their sensibilities. Or they just and disagree. Right, and that's, right, that's the thing that right. annoys me the most about the internet today. And nobody from 1992 thought this way. You know, nobody- I don't see it as much as people seem to think it's there though. I mean, I, I, I see people disagree without trying to, I mean, the word is cancel, right? Cancel yeah. culture. Yeah. I don't see any cancel culture. I see people doing what they've always done. There's always been a, a set of people who wanted to shut other people down. And they're on the blue team and the red team. They're, they're not, you know, it's, it's not a culture because it's not, there's not a single mode of thought around it. There's all kinds of people who think that way. It's more like human nature uh, or certain humans nature to want to shut things down that they don't feel they don't, comfortable with yeah they don't agree with or don't feel comfortable with but uh yeah. the difference is in 1992 on the internet at least uh nobody tried to shut anything down at all right 
uh, for the longest time, uh, you might say, that's, those are bad people. I don't want to have any dealings with them. But you didn't try to get them fired from their jobs. You, know, you didn't try to get their domain name uh, administrators to, or you know, uh, vendors to pull their domain names. Uh, you didn't try to get them bounced off uh, you know, the, the earlier equivalents of uh, Facebook or Twitter, et cetera. And so I think that is a very different uh, regime that's emerged since, I don't know what, 2015, 2016, somewhere in that time frame. Uh, well, would what, you say regime? But I, I mean, I think people have, have, I think people were doing that back then. It may be more so now and people may just be more aware or more thinking more about ways to do that. I don't think it works very often. I mean, there's a, uh, our, our friend on the well, Harry Henderson, uh, has pointed to a site that's like a database of like cancellations, you know, blue, red, whatever. And a lot of those things, if you start reading through them, they didn't succeed. You know, people may have aspired to cancel somebody, but the cancellation didn't really happen cooler heads would prevail or whatever. No, uh, there there's a lot that did. It, it might have been fire, the fire database of cancellations. Yeah, fire, that's it. That, that's it that, go through and read that. I read that regularly. And a significant number of them do succeed and, and are uh, some of them are extremely egregious. In fact, uh, the um, MIT Free Speech Alliance, which you mentioned I was the president of, which I no longer the president. I was able to find finally a person to hand over the responsibility. So now the former president, uh, but we uh, formed that in reaction to an actual cancellation at MIT, uh, where uh, a guy named Dorian Abbott was to give a, a talk, sponsored talk, on the climates of exoplanets uh, of all odd things. You know, the what's the weather on uh, a planet around Alpha Centauri, right? And because he had uh, published an essay with another uh, academic in Newsweek, you know, there's a real radical rag, right, on an alternative to so-called the diversity, equity, and inclusion called merit, fairness, and equality, uh, you know, of which things people can disagree, right? It's a perfectly reasonable argument. In fact, 75% of Americans would agree with Dorian Abbott, actually, as it turns out. Uh, but uh, the Twitter mobs got mobbing. And foolishly, 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 the MIT administration bent the knee and canceled Dorian Abbott's scientific talk. But and they 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 didn't completely cancel him, right? They diverted him to to a different context. Well, what they did, well, totally different. You know, they this was a endowed lecture that had an uh, had, had a uh, honorarium, travel, you know, high class, important event that you'd want on your resume. Instead, they offered him to come to. Uh, the department and give a talk to the other, uh, and this was for the public, more important, uh, uh, high value, you know, a, thousand, a couple thousand people, right? Uh, and instead, they he could come and give a, you know, a, a lecture at the department, you know, and uh, I'm quite involved in this kind of stuff. And uh, that's a very, I mean, it's, it's not zero prestige, but it's not much. I mean, I could probably talk myself into coming and giving a lecture at uh, uh, a few academic departments. So it's not a very, very important thing. So it was a, a literal dishonor. The previous thing was an academic honor, uh, and they dishonored him because of difference of a legitimate difference of opinion about public policy. Uh, and there's who made that decision? Uh, the chairman of the Earth and Planetary Sciences Committee, nominally. But we have discovered through research that it was with the uh, approval of at least the provost, who's equivalent of the COO or the chief academic officer for the university, uh, and probably the president as well. Well, in the state of have Texas, any... we've had a lot of okay. uh, that sort of activity, especially in education, uh, you know, in both uh, higher education, uh, you know, even you know, high schools and elementary schools pulling uh, various books and restricting teaching of various things. And it's uh, happened on both the left and the right. It's generally the extremes that are promoting these uh, cancellations. And uh, from what I've observed, a lot of these things got way more exposure and way more mileage by being canceled then if you just said, okay, let them speak, go, you go, go watch them if you want to. And then it just blows over and they're pretty much ignored. But when you make it a big deal, that it becomes a big deal. Yeah. There's some truth to that. And you are right. These, uh, 
this, uh, you know, suppressor attitude is with both the left and the right. Uh, there was an egregious case in Florida where uh, the University of Florida tried to ban the professors uh, from criticizing the don't say gay law because, oh, we're, you're, you're government employees. You can't be criticizing legislation. And of course, uh, the court said, you got to be fucking kidding me, right? Yeah. So to say that this is only a phenomenon from the right is certainly wrong. But if you look at the FIRE database, you'll see uh, about three to one or four to one uh, from the left. Uh, for every four on the left, there's one on the right. And then it's interesting, probably there's one or two that I would say are, uh, ep economic, are, are administrative bullying, neither left nor right. I didn't think right. it was three to one. I thought it was more like two to, two to, one, two to one, like. I think a little bit more than that. But yeah, go, I, go take was... a, I would encourage people to go take a look and just walk through the FIRE database of, uh, of uh, events. And, you know, and, and if you want to score them yourself, score them yourself. The other one that jumped out for me. But you I, know, that's that kind of cancellation. But there's a lot of stuff that the right does to try to suppress and to try to shut people down. And, it, and not the least of which is like, uh, well, the election was rigged. I won it. He didn't, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, crazy, I, crazy I wouldn't like let that. the right off the hook by saying that they do that less than the left does, because I don't think they I don't think they do it any less. And I think sometimes they do it in ways that are more egregious. They do it different. And I'll tell you what the biggest offender of the right is, the right uh, offense. And this is very bad. And the magnitude may well be worse than academic uh, cancel culture are these troll mobs that attack people, uh, particularly women, people of color. Uh, gay people, anybody who is not, uh, you know, square, uh, right-wing American, right? Uh, vicious, vicious online assaults, uh, you know, calling their homes, harassment, death threats. Uh, that is the tool of the right-wing troll. And, and, you know, I recently wrote a paper, uh, it was published in Quillet, uh, where I talked about uh, the need for decorum moderation. Uh, and this is where people like Elon Musk are, you know, uh, potentially about to make a gigantic error. Uh, uh, while I strongly believe in viewpoint freedom of speech, if you want to talk about Holocaust denial, go ahead and talk about Holocaust denial. You're showing the world you're an ass clown, but if you do it pub uh, politely, uh, uh, and when people challenge you and put evidence in your face, you don't curse them. Uh, then go ahead and do it. But we have to keep decorum. We can't allow trolls and attackers to do, engage in personal attacks and, and engage in racial slurs, uh, threaten to kill people, threaten to beat people up. Uh, you know, that is the thing that is the civility online is indispensable. And uh, people have kind of forgotten that in this uh, viewpoint uh, suppression question. Uh, we, we, and by the way, I believe we can ex uh, ex safe, safely accept a wider window of uh, discourse about ideas if we insist people do it absolutely politely, without any threats, without any personal attacks, without any doxing, uh, and, and all that. That, that, that yeah. I believe, is just indispensable. You How and I have recently talked about the use of this word woke, you know, woke, wokies, things like that. And... Um, I think that um, in some contexts, that's like a trigger word that really upsets people and, you know, could be a breach of decorum in the sense you're talking about it, but you didn't seem to feel that way. Don't you think that, I mean, don't you think that woke is, since it has become a pejorative, is, is, it, is more of a trigger, more of a term that might upset people? I think it's okay to upset people. Uh, you know, at the time we had that discussion, I pointed out that I regularly uh, castigated Trump supporters by calling them Trumpsters and uh, the QAnons by calling them QAnuts, and nobody on the well ever complained about that. But uh, uh, when I used one that, that, that some of them might have personally identified with, like, oh, my God, he's taking both. Wah, 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 wah. Uh, I was unimpressed uh, entirely. And now I'm having fun with them over there. I now refer to it as the mind virus that may not be named. What do you think about the trend in social media for AI to be doing the moderation? We had a recent thing where our uh, YouTube uh, program that we do on, uh, we do a live show on YouTube uh, every Thursday, and we had one that got flagged by YouTube because they, uh, we included a uh, 
clip from a U.S. government uh, civil defense uh, film from back in the 50s, just a, a brief little thing. They said that we uh, were violating the copyright of the Rap Act. And I found the Rap Act had just used the same clip in their thing. So we were all <laughs> you know, trans transgressing upon the government's copyright, I guess. But the AI just, you know, that's all it took was just it, it recognized that sound file and flagged it. Oh, and I can tell you all about that. I, I, I can't prove it, but I believe that I was a victim of uh, AI censorship on Facebook. Uh, we alluded to it a couple times, this thing called Game B. We had a very, we have a very active, had a very active community on Facebook, you know, about 4,000 people, you know, many, many posts, uh, very good a thing. Uh, and it, it was a little, it's a little curious. I mean, we're very heterodox in our politics, neither right nor left, talking about an operating system for the future, but in a fairly serious, semi-scholarly way. I mean, there's no, and we don't even talk about current events. There's actually a rule against talking about current events. Uh, well, right the day after Biden was inaugurated, uh, all three admins for our group were terminated by Facebook simultaneously. Uh, with the death penalty form, the one that's not appealable. Uh, it, it says, right, when you go, you just may not be appealed, you're dead, fuck you, right? And uh, I'm reasonable, uh, I shouldn't say I'm convinced, but I think the, the most parsimonious explanation is that they, right at the same time, they were launching their war against QAnon and that uh, their algorithm somehow saw another group that used unusual terminology, even though it was com the completely different end of the spectrum, completely different level of intellect. Everything about it was different. But nonetheless, one could imagine it triggering an algorithm that said, this is QAnon, let's squat those fuckers. Uh, you know, and truthfully, if we hadn't been well connected, uh, including John helped us, uh, several other people did too, including Joe Rogan, uh, we raised quite a large stink and Facebook looked into it and 12 hours later, they reversed it. Uh, but if we hadn't been well connected with friends that had that new people inside of Facebook, we could have just disappeared. Here's a community trying to save the world with good work, I would argue. You can disagree with us, but if you read our stuff, and I always challenge anyone who thought we were no good, go read our stuff. Tell me how, why we're no good. Uh, we've been gone because an AI hunter killer thought we somehow looked like you and I. No, yeah, and from what time. I was able to gather at the time, I'm pretty sure that was the case, that it was an AI thing initially. And... Um, Actually, I'm surprised it took them as long as it did to restore your access. Um, they probably had a lot of discussion about it in the background. But um, and we're not the only ones. We know lots of people. The uh, you know Michelle Bowens, one of the nicest human beings on earth, who runs the Peer to Peer Foundation, uh, which is another do-gooder outfit. He's constantly being zapped by uh, Facebook. And uh, no is that why he started ranting about cancel culture so much? That's part, one of the reasons. Uh, and, uh, you know, how in the world, I mean, this is the, one of the sweetest, nicest human beings in the world who's it's doing true. great work for humanity, and he's constantly being harassed by Facebook. Huge uh, support for co ops. Yeah, he's a, a co ops and the commons in general. I mean, this yeah. is a very progressive, very thoughtful person, and he's now being radicalized uh, by the treatment he's been getting from uh, the online world. And you know, in my, my essay that I wrote, one of the things I suggested was that all, uh, you know, fo here are the following things I think would reform moderation. One, uh, moderation codes uh, should be written like legal codes, hierarchically with numbered chapters, sections, and subsections. Uh, if you are charged uh, under violation of uh, whatever the rule, whatever rule they say, whether it's decorum or content or danger or any of them, you, they must quote you a piece of text, no more than a hundred words, plain English, which explains what it is you're guilty of and attach it to a specific piece or more than one piece of content. Number one, because today they just say, you have violated the terms of service. You know, uh, Now in Twitter's case, it's not terrible because it's sort of written in sort of plain English. But in Facebook's case, it's page after page after page of mind-numbing horseshit, right? So it doesn't tell you a goddamn thing. Oh, you violated our terms of service. So anyway, I should tell you 100 words or less, hierarchically numbered section of the criminal code this is what you did. You can appeal uh, any algorithmic uh, action to a human, and they should be required to have that review in 24 hours. 
Then, if you don't like that, you should be able to go to an arbitrator. I, think I, I, I laid out this scheme uh, where you have to put up $100 to put your claim to arbitration. Uh, if it goes to arbitration, uh, literally use the American Association of Arbitrators, which I've used uh, at Network Solutions to resolve thousands of uh, domain squatting cases, as it turns out. And it works well, very high fidelity. Uh, and if you win, the platform pays you 10x. So if you put up your hundred dollars, you get a thousand dollars back. Uh, if you lose, you lose your hundred bucks. Hundred bucks goes to the to the arbitrator, as it turns out. And then to make it even more fun, I proposed that the uh, uh, the appellant, the person who had been thought they had been do done wrong by the platform, could put as big a stake as they want up to a million dollars for Facebook's uh, in Facebook's case, uh, up to a hundred thousand for Twitter. Scale it by size, and if you win, you get paid back ten x what you put up. Uh, and if you lose, you lose your stake. And so that poor people could play, make a marketplace in these claims. So you, here, here's my text, which they said violated the terms. Here's what they said, violate, here's the terms they said I violated. Who wants to bet at 10 to one odds uh, that I will prevail when an independent arbitrator looks at this case? And so any person with two nickels to rub together could get a million dollars to back their claim if it's a good one. And I believe that that kind of ecosystem would force these platforms to make intelligent decisions 90% of the time. It turned out they were making the right decision 90% of the time. They'd make money off these uh, off these bets. If they are uh, if they are uh, not making the right decision 90% of the time, they'll lose money. And I think this is a very interesting ecosystem play to force them to do a good job. Well, you know, I think the problem with Facebook, maybe to a lesser extent with Twitter and some of the other social media platforms, is that I mean, they're social platforms, and that should be their business, but really their business is, as everybody knows, is that they're selling attention, right? Exactly. So their focus is on selling attention. And this whole idea of like moderating content or moderating discussions is a distraction, you know, your expense for them, right? Yeah. Yeah. So they don't, they don't really want to think about it and they want to minimize the cost of it. And that's, just not the way to do it. I mean, if, if you have a social platform, I mean, you know, we have all these years on the well, the well definitely has a system that um, for, you know, for better or worse, uh, usually for better, it, it was originally called fair witness and now they call it a host, but you have hosts of every, uh, we call them like conferences, but topics, forums. Uh, every forum on the well has a host, usually two hosts, sometimes more than that. You know, we, we know of one that has four hosts or five. And um, those people are paying attention to the conversations and, and they're participating in the conversations at the same time. And they're in a position to, to be very effective. They're all volunteers. They're not paid to do it but they're in a position to be very effective in, in managing those conversations. Sometimes it doesn't work and sometimes it works really well, but most of the time it does work. I mean, it, and I personally think that that's the way to go. And when you talk about moderation, I think moderation is a, it's social. It's not something you do with a, an algorithm and it's not something that you do with a heavy hand, you if if a conversation is getting out of hand, you don't try to shut it down. You try to manage it, you know, and you can manage it socially. Yep, I've been doing that for forty years, right? Yeah. And, and there's a that's an also though an important distinction. Uh, th there are private spaces or what I call domain spaces on the net, and you know, like think of subreddit uh, Reddit as a pure example. Everything on Reddit is one of the 200,000 subreddits. Each subreddit has an, a owner and typically a team of admins and their, their rule is law. I mean, they can say whatever they want. You know, famously, the Harley Davidson subreddit would not allow discussions about Japanese motorcycles. Oh, well, their house, their rule. Uh, uh, Facebook has groups, right? Uh, and, and some people accuse me of hypocrisy by saying, hey, what well, not your Facebook group on Facebook? Don't you have some pretty stringent rules? And I go, hell yes, we do, right? Uh, we have rules against racists and anti-Semites. We have racist uh, arguments against personal attacks. We have 
an explicit rule that if you uh, use an obscene lang word uh, targeted at another member, you will be expelled immediately. I said, uh, you know, isn't this hypocrisy? You're, you know, you're holding your members to a much higher standard than Facebook does. And I go, well, it's because we're a private group. It's like a country club. Uh, it's why, you know, uh, much as I don't particularly like the, uh, the action of the moderators in, uh, on this particular conference on the well that we were talking about, their house, their rules. I'd like to make fun of them, uh, but uh, you know, I'll go along with their rule. But, but you know, I just think they're idiots. But hey, that's their house, their rules. And that's why I think that, that to the degree that the net is back to the where we, is where we, the conversation goes full circle. You know, where it's like CompuServe in 1985, where it was hundreds, probably thousands by then of special interest groups. And each one of those, by the way, had an owner. And they actually paid them a royalty based on the revenue that came in. Uh, and they had a team of admins to help them. Uh, I think that that's a really wonderful way to moderate the group. But the, where it breaks down is in the public spaces, right? In Facebook case, the conversations that have happen outside of groups, uh, and then in Twitter's case, the whole Twitter is open. There is no groups in Twitter. Uh, everybody self-organizes self their own virtual community uh, in Twitter. And, and so the, the things I'm talking about only apply to the public spaces. I, I'm absolutely with you that uh, the best moderation is organic and local to a domain of interest. Uh, but when we have public spheres, the public square, as uh, uh, Elon Musk liked to say, uh, then I think probably for I think over 25 million a year a month unique visitors there really ought to be a regulation that makes it at least something like a public square well maybe but the way I think about that is that if it's a public square it should be public which means it wouldn't be a privately owned space it would be I mean you don't have a public square inside of a department store you have it Actually, right. you do. I mean, let me give you the example: the Prune Yard case, California versus Prune Yard, mm. uh, is a I, famous I case one. where uh, uh, a court, a federal court, ruled that people had the right to pass out leaflets in a shopping mall. Uh, now, it was actually under California constitutional law rather than U.S. constitutional law, and U.S. constitutional law probably doesn't support it. But the idea, I think, is correct that something like a shopping mall is constructively a public square. And something like Twitter or the public aspects of Facebook are constructively like a public square. And I would argue in favor of the even the fact they're privately owned. Uh, read the argument of Prune Yard. It's a great legal case. Type in Prune Yard uh, decision and you can pull it up. Logic. Yeah, no, I remember it. I, I still, I don't completely agree with that. I, I just think that if you want to have a public space, it should be public. It shouldn't be owned by somebody else. Well, the reality is it is owned. If we had a well, uh, that's we had the reality public, now. But we, we public utility, that'd be great. Uh, but yeah. truthfully, I'd be think about that. Unfortunately, in our current politics, whichever whichever uh, party owned the executive branch would be very tempted to fuck with uh, the, the terms and services to aid their people. In the same way, we see how states are fucking with voting regulations, for instance to, you know, gerrymander or, or, you know, make it more advantageous for their supporters to vote versus the other parties. Both parties do it all the time. Uh, Republicans seem to be a little bit more obnoxious and egregious about it at the moment. But, you know, it's what you'd expect from game theory. If there's a knob that you can turn advantageously to your side, you're going to do it. Uh, again, that makes me a little dubious about a public one, you know, a, uh, you know, an independent not for profit that somehow was magically governed by philosopher kings. Uh, maybe it would, maybe I'd trust it, uh, but I would suggest that even in the, the privately owned ones, if it's above a certain scale and it has an open space, you know that's the key distinction. To a degree, it's like Reddit. Reddit does what it wants. Facebook groups do what they want. The well conferences, uh, you know, the host uh, the host is law, right? Uh, but to the places that have an open space, they should. I would argue. Uh, should be governed by essentially a public square ethos. Hey, Jim, we've, we're getting close. We're like 10 minutes away from the end of the hour, and I haven't brought up Game B yet. All right, and we'll we don't have a lot of time left, but the first que question I really had was about Metacrisis. And, you know, I know you mentioned Metacrisis in the notes you gave us, and um, I'm just thinking about which crises are the most significant right now. And, and I mean, I feel that you believe that game A is going down and game B needs to be, you know, 
percolating in order to come up with some alternatives. But where's the crash coming from? In and the opinion? crash may not actually crash, right? Uh, that's one of the things we learned from complex uh, system study is trying to predict the unfolding of a complex system is impossible. What right. you can do is uh, contemplate a bundle of trajectories and maybe loosely assign probabilities to different scenarios. But some of the ones that we see coming, uh, you know, I think climate uh, will get us if we don't do something about it. It'll take a while. You know, it won't really crush the West for probably 100 years, but it will crush other parts of the world earlier than that and will produce a lot of harm even in the West. And it's already doing so right now. Uh, but within 30 years, it'll be very noticeable. Uh, I think that um, a collapse of our democracy is a real possibility from either the right or the left, more likely from the right at the moment. Uh, but I think there's risks on both sides there. Uh, I, I think that there's something that we don't really understand that's going on to our collective sense making. Uh, you know, that this Facebook, Twitter uh, world is making us both crazy and stupid simultaneously. Uh, and we literally could get crazy enough and stupid enough that our society just break down. Uh, I think that's a possibility. I think that we're the ever increasing economic inequality is reaching the points historically where eventually uh, people bring out the pitchforks and the uh, and the torches and go uh, burn down the houses of the billionaires. I think that could happen, uh, particularly in the face of uh, say a big economic decline, which could happen at any time. Uh, I think that nuclear war is back on the on the hit parade as a, a real possibility. I wouldn't put it up as a huge possibility, but even a small possibility of uh, nuclear war is uh, is really worth thinking about. Uh, you know, I think that you could have. I mean, there's so many other problems with a complex system. A small, relatively small effect in one place can cascade throughout the system. So, for instance, uh, as we know, reading the paper, uh, Ukraine and Russia, between them, are responsible for a big part of the wheat export in the world. And Belarus and Russia between them are uh, responsible for the majority of the fertilizer exports in the world. Uh, that's going to impact food prices substantially, particularly in the Middle East, Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, suppose it tips those regions into re revolution, right? What does that do? You know, produces 20 million refugees heading for Europe and people dying by the millions. What does that do? We don't know. Uh, and so that's the, the other the other part of the meta crisis is all these smaller crises and and impacts on our systems that are becoming less and less robust uh, will can cascade and produce all kinds of unanticipated side effects. So I won't, I'm not going to sit here and say that we can call a shot and say this is the one that's going to bite us in the ass. I can say if we don't do something about climate. It will bite us in the ass, but it'll take a while. But there's a whole bunch of ones that are in nearer and closer that could bite us in the ass at any time. So game B is a way to think about an alternative, right? Correct. Uh, you know, way to think about a way of living. And in short, you know, real short, then let's talk about climate because that's the easiest one. But we, we can apply it to all the other ones. Roughly speaking, uh, for people who live in, let's say, Europe, uh, we, should, we need to cut our consumption of energy and stuff by a factor of three, approximately. But... If you just tell people to do that, they're not going to do it. Think of look what happened with the Yellow Jacket Revolution, a small proposed uh, increase in the diesel price and almost overthrew the French government. Uh, if we were to actually apply sufficiently strong sanctions to bring about a, a 3x reduction in our market consumption of gasoline and diesel, uh, the Yahoos would be in the streets with their rifles immediately. I guarantee it. Uh, so what you have to do, and this is the game B finesse, is at the same time come up with a way of living that's three times better. So I, we now call it the three-three model: cut our consumption by three, increase our human well-being by three, recreate uh, the meso scale. You know, since 1870, the West has destroyed the face-to-face -face communities and the extended families that were the basis for human civilization for hundreds of thousands of years, probably as far as we know, and replaced it with the cold transaction of the market and the government. Uh, the game B thesis is to recreate life at the level of uh, the so-called Dunbar number, about 150, maybe 300, uh, where you have actually a rich way of life where uh, things like childcare and education are just built into your local community, right? And are the way your local community wants it, right? You have local community uh, mores, how you all choose to live, and you have trust, and you're never gonna be homeless. If you live in a proto B, 
one of these uh, Dunbar sale communities, something bad happens to you, they'll take care of you, just like they did in the old uh, rural agricultural village. Somebody couldn't work anymore. They didn't let them starve to death. They put them in somebody's attic and they fed them, right? Uh, and the same is going to be true under Game B, is to return humanity to human well-being at the human scale of uh, social interaction at around the scale of 150. And then the 150s interact with each other through a, uh, a you know, complex system design that we're working on, don't have all the answers yet. We call it membranes and protocols. Uh, and that so they can operate for the really big stuff. We're still going to want to do really big stuff. Humanity still needs to go to the stars, right? We still need to be able to deflect asteroids when they come after our ass, right? Uh, but, uh, and so we'll, we need to not, you know, be hippies living in, in, you know, mud huts in a village of 150. We need to be a human species that's solving the big problems, but we're grounded and living on earth in these communities. And oh, by the way, we move from one community to the other. Uh, I can, we imagine a, uh, like the Amish, you know, the Amish famously send their kids out into the world for two years to raise hell uh, before they have them come back and become Amish again, right? Mm -hmm. And so we imagine Game B kids going out and looking at Game A, and then also traveling around to various Game B communities and finding out which ones are good fits for them. And so that's, uh, you know, that's the Game B vision. Is it exponential growth from a small number to eventually reaching the tipping point, which uh, there's some research to indicate somewhere between three and 15% of the population has a new positive vision for society. When, when most people believe they're in a negative uh, society, the society can tip at that point and go to the other attractor. So that's the Game B strategy in a nutshell. So is there a structure to, to Game B? Famously not. Uh, famously not. It's self-assembling. Uh, the best place to find out more about it is the Game B Home. Once we got burned by Facebook, we said, fuck those chumps, and we built our own online community, uh, www.game-b.org. There's thousands of people there. Uh, they're organized into all kinds of different projects. Uh, some of them are working on building these proto bees on the ground. Others are working on things like parenting and education and healthcare and permaculture, uh, et cetera. And uh, we're going to try to do it. Uh, with minimal structures, no legal entities, though we may actually set one up fairly soon. Uh, the other place to learn about Game B is the Game B film that you mentioned, Game B film, all one word, dot O-R-G, 16 minutes long, they're about kind of a lightweight and somewhat charming animation that uh, at least gives the ethos of Game B. I wouldn't say it gives the doctrines and theories, but it gives the ethos. And if you don't like the ethos, then probably you won't like us. So if you want to invest 16 minutes, watch the film. And if you like the film, uh, come and get it. And Game B is. sounds a bit like uh, a, an intellectually sound uh, version of what I used to hear from, from some friends of mine who were survivalists. They were going to have their own game going. It didn't work out too well for any of them, but uh, it sounds like Game B is a little more intellectually and uh, uh, positive uh, sounding thing. Yeah, and the other idea we, where we got some inspiration was from the intentional community movement in the 70s, uh, most of which did not work out for various reasons. And then one we study very carefully because it did work out is the Israeli kibbutz movement, which started over 100 years ago. And most of them are still going strong. And uh, the Israeli kibbutz is, even though they're only 2% of Israeli uh, society, are responsible for 50% of the agricultural production in Israel and 20% of the industrial uh, production in Israel. And, uh, they, and they have morphed. They all start out as hardcore egalitarian socialists. Uh, and now there's about 20% still are, but then now there's a, quite a range of how they've arranged themselves with respect to their economics and their, and their political infrastructure. So there's many lessons, many places to look. And there's, uh, of course, intentional communities that are still blooming up. Uh, one of our partners in one of our proto bees uh, currently lives in a place called Oroville, which is a, a community in India, which has been pretty successful, though it's got its problems at the moment. Uh, so we're going to learn from what's been uh, uh, done before. And of course, we're going to bring some systems thinking, some complexity science thinking, and a spirit of radical empiricism and experimentation. Uh, one of the things we think is most important is nobody think of Game B as a utopian idea. You know, we don't have a book that says, this is how it should be. And if you don't do this, we're going to send you to the gulags, right? That would be totally anti-Game B. We expect each of these Game B communities to have its own local rules. And as long as you agree on a few basic principles about living within Mother Nature's uh, constraints, 
uh, then they can do what they want. You want to have a Proto B that's a Victorian village? Fine. You want to have one that's a sex cult? You feel free to do that too, right? Uh, so long as you do it in a way that's ecologically conscious and that you at least in good faith, faith believe is increasing human well-being. Well, is it safe to say that, that Game B at this point is more of a brainstorm that might refine into uh, something more structured in the future? It's, con it's trend doing the transition right now. Literally, proto bees are starting to spring up. There's two of them on the ground now. Uh, there's probably 25 that people are in the planning stages or the at least trying to get organized stage. I know two others that are getting closer to actually buying their land. Uh, so I'd say we're right in, at the cusp between think, 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 and do, do, do. So we are at the end of the hour, and uh, there's probably a lot more we could say about Game B. I hope you will come back sometime and we can have that discussion. Yeah, happy to do it. Happy Excellent. Do. Yeah, well, thanks, good. Jim. Thanks yeah. so much for joining us today. Yeah, it's been a good conversation. I figured it probably would. You can follow the Plutopia News Network at plutopia.io. On Facebook, go to at Plutopia News. On Twitter, it's at Plutopia. With John Lepkowski, I'm Scoop Sweeney. This is the Plutopia News Network, 20 minutes into the future.